Welcome all uh, to this nice event. I'm very glad uh, to, uh, that you invited me to this uh, nice conference. It's a very uh, good subject, both in academics and in academia and in business. Um, is the new topic, well, I will give a discussion on that today. So this was my, uh, my title for today, a bit of a thought-provoking one. Uh, but first of all, let me go back to why uh, we would potentially need a new paradigm. Sometimes we forget when we uh, think about sustainability, we think about all the nice things, but sometimes we forget all the issues and why we're actually doing this. So, so look at these pictures in, in Beijing, for instance. We have air pollution, there's unemployment, climate change, uh, also still child labor. All these things are still very common in the world. So that's why, regardless, I think we need a new paradigm for business. So what we're dealing with are wicked issues. There's no clear beginning, no clear end point. Uh, sometimes the one problem is a symptom of another. But, uh, well, this was already a theory in 1973 that uh, we basically need to start with solutions. We need to start trials. And that's why I think the circular economy could be a potential tool to start actually some of these transitions. So that's why I think, regardless, a new paradigm is needed. We need systems change to tackle some of these wicked issues. And there's challenges and opportunities, because when we think about the way currently business is done, the current business forms are actually not really suited to tackle some of these issues. We look at the PLC, a public limited company, and there it doesn't really say, like, you have to do good for the environment and society. It doesn't really reward you for being good, and it doesn't really directly punish you for being bad either. So that's a big problem. So all the businesses uh, that I might mention in my presentation, I think they are quite forward-looking, and they might actually do stuff that are not necessarily uh, rewarded for uh, in, a, yeah, in a financial sense directly, but they're doing it because they think uh, it's the right way forward. So personally, I think that uh, many businesses can do uh, proactive work to actually change their purpose and accountability, regardless of how the business is actually structured. So the real issue, the way that uh, we see the world at the moment, economy is most important, and um, society and environment are part of that. But of course, that's not reality. We need the environment to actually sustain our society and the economy, but that's not really the way we actually set up the way we do business and the way our society thinks at the moment. We might think like that personally, but a lot of the way we work is not really set up like this. So one of my areas is actually sustainable business models. And some of you might recognize this. Do you recognize this diagram? Yeah, I think there's many business model experts in the room. So this is the uh, Osterwalder and Pinier business model canvas. And some of the knowledgeable people in the room might see how I manipulated this one. So it basically added the triple bottom line to it. So I think that's something that Osterwalder and uh, Pinier had forgotten in their original version. So I think when you think about new uh, business, you should think about the, uh, the value proposition. Not only how can we make as much profit, uh, profit as possible, but also what is the pro uh, proposition to society and environment. So I think that's the way we should actually look at all the new business models we introduce at the moment. So this is a way of looking at it. So at the core, there's a value proposition. On the left is the way you create value through your partnerships, key activities and resources. On the right is the way you deliver value through new customer segments. And the way you capture value in the future circular economy or sustain sustainable society, that might change quite a lot of well. For instance, when you move from selling products to selling services, because you don't get money instantly, but you might get it over time as a business. So I think in a potential circular economy, we need to rethink all those elements. And now, well, uh, of course, when you start looking at, at this picture, you think, oh, these are nice tick boxes. I start a new business. I just do everything, and I do it a little bit differently. But actually, this is quite a huge and significant change to go through, especially when you have an established business and everything is set up around selling products as fast as possible. So now a bit on sustainability and circularity. Is the new paradigm? To me, I think it has always been there. The thinking behind circular economy has always been there. And so sustainability is a big picture. I think it's not gone yet, and it shouldn't be gone either. So what do we want to optimize? Well, do we want to circularize the world? I'm not even sure whether that's a proper word. But I think uh, we need to think about the end goal. Why are we doing this? 
And to me, sustainability is still the end goal. We need to have intergenerational uh, equity and also make sure that future generations can live in a nice way like the, like the way we try to do now. And from products to services, that's just an element of it. And in business model terms, it looks like this. So to me, sustainable business models are the overarching one. Circular business models are part of that, but you could also imagine some circular business models that might not be sustainable. For instance, when you sell products quicker and quicker, you might remanufacture them, but you need a lot of energy to actually do that. So if you have very, very quick circular cycles, it might actually be, be unsustainable. Similarly, PSS, there's some sustainable PSS, but it's also unsustainable PSS. So that's why there's sort of Venn diagrams that don't overlap everywhere, and that's why they're not all sustainable, in my opinion. So we need to be very careful that, like, when we implement such things, that we think about what are the consequences, what is my ideal, what do I want to achieve, and keep that end goal in mind. So a bit on the background, sustainability is basically about the triple bottom line, people, profit and planet, intergenerational equity, so thinking about future generations as well as our current ones. At the moment with the sustainable uh, development goals, I think we're well on our way to creating more equ equality in the world. I think the uh, developing world is raising its standards, which is a good thing, but also we need to think about the whole world and the big picture and think about how can we actually maybe uh, live with le fewer resources here in the West to create better equality? Uh, John Elkington uh, um, operationalized this big term as people, profit and planet. So the triple bottom line and then sustainability oriented innovation or sustainable business model innovation as part of that is that corporate innovation that is at a profit. So it's not a non-profit activity while taking into account societal and environmental benefits. So trying to do as little harm as possible, but trying to do a net positive, for instance, contributing to health and, um, um, for instance, biodiversity through business. Circular, uh, circularity, when you look at that, it has much more of a resource and profit focus. So the societal element, to my opinion, is still quite absent. It's sort of implicit. When you look at the Alan MacArthur Foundation as one of the promoters of the circular economy, I think the uh, focus is very much on profit. How can businesses make more profit through a circular economy? The word of climate change doesn't appear in their uh, communications because they feel like it scares off people. So that's why they want to focus on planet and profit, but planet very implicitly and mainly the profit uh, angle. So looking at the Ellen MacArthur uh, Foundation, they look at how can you preserve natural capital. So again, the word capital is in there. Uh, improve resource yields, but also look at systems effectiveness, which is of course a very big picture, but it re refers back to the issue of wicked issues, that trying to optimize one thing might sort of contribute to an, uh, an issue in another area. So that's why as a business, which is very hard, you need to keep thinking about the big picture and the system. I think some of the tools on the LCA, maybe we get uh, an overview on that later, will also help us to think about the big picture. Um, in the book um, with uh, Christian Kraienhagen and um, Cecile van Oppen on circular business, we also looked at uh, earlier work, for instance, by Walter Stahel. He very clearly uh, made distinctions between different loops in the circular economy. First of all, you need to slow loops, like making sure that products last as long as possible. And then, only then, you need to think, uh, think about closing loops. So those are things like recycling. And narrowing loops, that's something we're actually already used to. And that's about uh, efficiencies in manufacturing, for instance, light weighting products as well. Those are the things that we're already quite used to in a circular economy. But I think in a narrow sense, many people who think about the circular economy, they think about recycling and optimizing that. But to me, it's first of all uh, making products that last longer and making sure they can be repaired and remanufactured. So circularity, to, my, uh, to, to very quickly summarize it, the hope is that we'll reduce resource use significantly while making profits go up. That's, of course, a very simplistic picture, but that's what everyone sort of keeps having in mind. As, as that's the end goal, and that's, of course, what we also want to achieve if we want to go to a future circular economy. So it also makes financial sense. To give a bit of a promotion of what a uh, circular economy could also be about, to me, uh, it could actually lead um, to cost savings, like if you're more efficient and all, the, all of these loops. 
uh, you can conserve resources, but it could also lead to uh, uh, hedging against future price shocks if you actually retain the materials, for instance, in a leasing model. Um, new forms of revenues, diversification. Um, I have some examples of businesses in here that actually set up new business lines as a result. Uh, sources of innovation, collaboration, you get to work with different types of people. Uh, customer interest and also being a good employer. So some of the businesses I spoke with, like Unilever, they basically say, well, um, employees or future employees, they don't want to work for us anymore, the, the youngsters, if, uh, if we're not offering a nice sustainable company to work for. So I think the future generation, they seem to be much more uh, yeah, aware of these issues and don't want to work for an unsustainable business anymore. Um, compliance being ahead of legislation, for instance, in the automotive industry and energy industry, there's already uh, legislations happening, so you can be ahead of that if you already develop your business model to be future-proof. Uh, business uh, resilience is also one of, the, one of the big ones. So there's many potential cases. So a bit about uh, the details, slow and closing and narrowing loops, what does it look like? So um, on the y-axis, you can see the slowing happening. So uh, that's, for instance, uh, creating a product that lasts longer. We'll have some examples in the presentation later. And also making sure it can be repaired. But you can make a product that, I don't know, lasts forever. But if it then cannot be recycled, then you haven't closed the loop. So there's always two parts to it. And Walter Sahel already explained that uh, in the 1970s, I guess, in one of his earlier reports. Um, but I think it's still very much on topic. So it's, uh, people still forget that those are two very separate loops that need to be optimized in the design. And the narrowing loops still remains relevant, like how can you do efficiencies in manufacturing, uh, lightweight products, but also take into account potential uh, contradictions between lightweighting and long-lasting products. So that's, it's, it's not easy. There's always dilemmas to be resolved in that sense. So to give some examples, uh, first of all, a company Vitsu. So Vitsu is a furniture company in the UK. Uh, it's uh, British, but also German. It makes stuff that is supposed to last beyond a lifetime. So uh, some of the shelves that they sell have ended up in people's wills and they also help you move uh, your house when you need to move and they actually take the shelves and move it with you. So they really try to make sure that you keep things forever. Also apparently they sell, uh, the shelves that they have, they sell for more money than they were actually sold for when they were uh, sold for the first time on eBay. So that's quite interesting. So they retain their value. Plus, um, they try not to oversell. And that's, for me, one of the very interesting ones. When you actually go to them, they say, OK, how much shell shelf space do you need? And some people like big shelves and whole walls with shelves. And they say, well, how much do you actually need? So they actually try to design it in a way to undersell rather than oversell, which is quite a different way of thinking. Of course, that cannot happen when you have prices like, uh, like IKEA. So it's quite a premium model. They say it's actually the real price of, of the products, taking into account potential environmental uh, degradation and also the fact that it lasts very long. But it is a premium model. So I think a shelf is probably 70 pounds and uh, just counting in pounds, I don't know, 80 euros. Whereas the IKEA shelf might be 8 euros. So it's quite a huge price difference. But then. Maybe an uh, IKEA shelf doesn't last long beyond the lifetime, I don't know. Uh, then, of course, uh, Patagonia is one of the famous brands, outdoor brands. They actually tell you not to buy a jacket. So they try to make you aware of the fact, like, do you need uh, this jacket? Of course, marketing people have criticized it and said, well, you don't think about the jacket, you actually want to buy it. But still, I think it's an interesting business model. They also experimented with zero growth. Like, what as a business we want to grow zero every year rather than, I don't know, 5% every year. I think their employees got quite frustrated. So it's also people's uh, motivation is very important because they thought, what do we do if we cannot grow as a business? What is our uh, motivation? How can we innovate? So it was ve a very difficult proposition for the employees. So they actually got rid of the zero growth model. And I think they probably have almost double digit growth because they're very popular as a brand at the moment. So. Yeah, um, is it a sustainable business? You can always question that then. Then Bugaboo, um, I think in the UK there's also a project called Rebus around uh, leasing 
uh, baby prams, uh, Bugaboo started a flex, a flex plan, so you can actually lease uh, a baby stroller rather than buying it, which is interesting because you usually don't need a baby stroller for 10 years, and the prospect of the product is that they can actually last for eight years. I don't know any baby that's still being carried around, carried around in that, so it's highly over-specified uh, as, as a product, of course, so it makes sense to lease it. Also, when you have, I don't know, two children rather than one, you can actually swap it for a bigger one. So it's also potentially a good proposition for the clients. Uh, you have to guess who signed up first for the uh, Bugaboo Flex plan. It was their biggest competitor, basically, wanting to know uh, what they were up to. And I think they sort of made an agreement and said, OK, if I share our data, then we want to know a bit about your innovations as well. So now I think they're all a bit friendly about it. But I think it's quite interesting. It's a very small uh, proportion of the business. But I think it's interesting that they openly experiment with it and, and just started it, because they believe it's, it's a good thing. Then closing resource loops. So once you have this particular waste and you cannot really do anything about it anymore, what should you do next? So Networks is a collaboration between Aquafil, uh, which is a supplier of, of plastics and nylon, uh, and Interface, a flooring company, and also the Zoological Society of London, which sounds to be like a, a, quite, a a, 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 quite a random partner in this whole uh, in this whole uh, space, but they basically found an found a issue, like they saw plastic in the sea, nylon fishing nets being discarded, and then they actually contacted Interface and said, well, do you not need nylon for your carpets? So they started this whole conversation, which was, which was very interesting. So it started with an NGO, so a Logical Society of London, with a particular issue, seeing a business opportunity, and now it's a very big project. And they're also setting up banks in the Philippines and collaborations with local people over there. So they also earn money out of the plastic sourcing, and they prevent them from throwing fishing nets in the, in the sea and creating that waste. Um, other ones are raw for the oceans, so they saw the big plastic soup in the sea, tried to source it and use it as part of the products. When you look at the products, it's only 10% of the material is that plastic, but hopefully in the future it will improve. So now it's potentially more marketing than uh, solving issues, but at least they're making a starting point. Uh, then uh, third one, a Dutch brand called Pluckies. So it's, uh, it's uh, slippers made from uh, the tires are basically uh, tires from Michelin are actually turned into the, the sole of the slippers. So it's quite interesting. It was a waste. They didn't know what to do with, um, they didn't know what to do with uh, those tires anymore. And basically, they now use it as a, as a sole of, uh, of slippers. And that's interesting because it's a waste and people find it dirty. So how do you actually use waste in a positive way? And if it doesn't touch your feet, then maybe it isn't a problem. But we do wear plastic from the sea in a sweater. So maybe it's also a sort of an image thing. And at TU Delft, where I'm based, um, we also do research on material-driven design. So what if we have this, these novel materials or these waste materials? How can you actually make it appealing to the customer again? So I think that's still a huge topic while we still have all these waste streams. And then um, a different example from the process industry, uh, British Sugar. So it's a sugar refining company, the biggest one in the UK at the moment. Uh, this is their industrial symbiosis network. So industrial symbiosis usually happens between different firms that are uh, co-located. So for instance, a uh, sugar refiner um, uh, with another processing plant that uses the waste. But this is actually an internal uh, symbiosis plan. So they have loads of waste streams and they all turn it into valuable products. Actually, their waste streams in terms of weight are equal to the sugar they actually sell. So they have as much co-products from waste as they sell sugar. Uh, they didn't give me the data on this, but I suspect that they actually make more money on their byproducts than on the actual sugar, because sugar is a declining industry and it gets less and less subsidies, of course, because of the bad connotations people nowadays have with sugar. But it's really interesting. So you can see that they started innovating in the 1940s uh, with, with lime uh, being used as an input to other products, with animal feed um, being actually created from the, uh, from the leftovers from the beets, from the sugar beets. 
um, they actually started selling back stones to, uh, to the farmers. So they actually cleaned the beads and actually the stones they could sell back to the farmers where they got <laughs> the stone from. So they're actually selling back waste to, to their own suppliers. Yes, you have a question? Oh yeah, five, five minutes. Um, and the biggest one is tomatoes. So they're actually the, bigger, they're the biggest tomato uh, grower in the UK at the moment. So next to sugar, they're the biggest sugar refiner and the biggest tomato grower in the UK. Because actually tomatoes like uh, CO2 and tomatoes like heat. And of course, uh, Great Britain, it's not really a, a hot country, so they could actually pump the CO2 and pump the latent heat into greenhouses and grow tomatoes. So it's quite extraordinary because, uh, of course, you need quite a different mindset to actually think that uh, sugar and uh, sugar and tomatoes could be compatible as a, as a business proposition. So they, of course, for each uh, innovation they did, they hired new managers, got in a new team. They couldn't do it alone because uh, they had very good contacts with, uh, with the farmers as well, uh, because the farmers basically had the knowledge and they knew that, um, that tomatoes like CO2 and heat. So through the collaborations they developed over the years, they could actually do this. I also have a paper on this, so if you're interested and intrigued by the example, I could send it to you later. Um, closing and slowing loops very, very sh shortly. Patagonia does um, repairs uh, and recycling, as well as encourage you, uh, encouraging you to reuse. So, have, so they have the common thread platform uh, at eBay, so you can also buy second hand, and they don't really earn money off the, the back of that, so have a look online. And Mud Jeans are famous Dutch uh, jeans brand, so you can actually lease a jeans. It's also a project that initially failed miserably because what happened was that uh, they didn't set it up with PayPal because it, it didn't really exist yet, so they had to do all the processing of the leased jeans manually. Uh, now they do it uh, very properly with PayPal and everything, and they also have a deposit system. So you buy jeans and um, you can also uh, get a discount on the second jeans when you uh, hand it in in a couple of years' time. So they have a lease model and a deposit system at the same time because they noticed that not everyone wants to lease. So there's different models emerging uh, in that space. And then um, what innovations might we miss by focusing on circularity only very quickly? Sustainable business model archetypes are examples of sustainable business models that we developed in the literature with colleagues. So I think one of the big things that we might miss is some of the social archetypes. So uh, thinking about biodiversity protection, uh, also the bottom of the pyramids. Um, scale-up solutions, um, also solutions around alternative ownership structures. There's many things that we might miss when we only look at uh, the circular economy. And also slow consumption. So I give you some examples of slow consumption, how you do it as part of the business model. But some people who think about the circular economy might only think about uh, recycling. So I think uh, you need to have quite a mature view of the circular economy in order to actually implement it in the best way. So that's why I think we need to take in mind that big picture. And also PSS. I think we will talk about it a lot more, delivering the functionality without the ownership. But if you don't have a mature view on what the circular economy might be, you might actually also miss that as an innovation. So some examples, just to have a look at so the diversity of business models that are emerging at the moment. And what tools might be useful, and of course I do some self-promotion here. 10, ten steps to a circular business. I really forgot the book because we actually sold out uh, yesterday, so I had the last <laughs> copy in my hands. Uh, it's in my bag, but it's in my room, so I didn't bring it. But uh, it's available at circularcollaboration.com. Uh, you will actually receive the improved and second print if you buy it now, because um, yeah, we sold it out to our own surprise within three months or so, four months. But uh, the book is organized by steps and also includes some of the cases that I presented and more. And hopefully it will help you uh, in your move to the circular economy by going through these steps, cases and tools. So one of the tools that is presented in the book is this one, the value mapping tool. And here you can see that sustainability and circularity come, uh, come closely together because it was actually developed for sustainable business model innovation, but we think it's also very suitable for the move to a circular economy. Because first you think about the value destroyed, like what as a business do you destroy in terms of value? Is it uh, deforestation? 
Um, uh, also exploitation of, of people, uh, I, I see that as a value destroyed as well, it still happens, it's quite commonplace in, uh, in supply chains. Value misses, uh, missed opportunities in a, in a business. I think uh, Airbnb did a great job in turning a missed opportunity in a new opportunity by renting out empty spaces in people's homes. And only when you think about value missed and value destroyed, then you should start thinking about <coughs> new opportunities. But so, mo most of the time when businesses start thinking about innovation, they start with the new opportunities. And I think by going in that sequence and looking at different stakeholder perspectives, you can actually come to better ideas that also resolve societal issues. So that's just a very quick overview of that one. So yeah, look again, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask now or do later over a coffee. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Plenty of time for questions. Anyone like to start? Or should I? Um, thanks for a very nice presentation. I'm, um, I, I like very much the nuances that you present to circular economy. Um, in your collaboration with uh, companies or in the way that you have studied companies, where do you start? Where, where is your entrance to even discuss circular econ economy? Um, yeah, I think on the one hand we're quite lucky that businesses come to us with a particular issue. Um, it could also be competitiveness related, like in, in one type of industry that we worked there was also an issue with where do we want to go in the future, future innovation. So I think that's often the entrance point, like we enter through the side of innovation, wanting <coughs> to do something new, and then we sort of secretly <laughs> role in this circularity agenda and, and talk about things like the other business cases that are presented, like uh, being proactive, being a good employer, um, future price shocks. There's loads of different reasons on, on why you should actually move to a circular or more sustainable business model. But innovation is often the route and then we sort of come in with a, with a different angle. So, so do you see that it's still um, an immaturity uh, of understanding circular economy or adopting circular economy in, in quite many organizations? Um, no, I, well, I do think that businesses start to understand uh, that they move, need to move in that direction, but they just don't have a clue of what it is, first of all, and then what to do. So one of the projects that I've been involved in is just coming to a close after two years, uh, was part funded by the British government. We worked with a big established business in trying to help them in the transition to a circular economy. We did loads of uh, experiments using techniques uh, from the lean startup as well, like creating minimal viable products and helping them. Uh, and this is a large established business, right? So they are used to selling the same products uh, every time. And so it was quite a challenge to, first of all, make them think that they need to think like a startup. And second of all, yeah, just making the start. And I think they've been, um, they've adopted some of the things that we uh, put forward. And the ones that they put forward, they basically didn't call it circular, but they just called it, I don't know, new business or whatever. So I think the circular brand is not so established yet in, in large businesses. Yeah. <laughs> Throw it. <laughs> I think in your last slides, you covered um, the circular economy with three aspects, economy, uh, economic, uh, social, and environmental. Uh, my question is, how could you uh, recommend uh, to make good trade-off between these three aspects? Because very often the economy, uh, uh, sorry, the environmental sustainability came with a cost, uh, especially when there's not a level play field in the industry if you right, really want to be the, you know, the pioneers, the drivers for this aspect. How to balance this? Mm. 
Yeah, I think we're both uh, startups and large businesses uh, we work with. We try to create something that is very appealing from the customer side as well. So when we think about these innovations, I actually almost sometimes feel like a consultant that tries to create a new innovation that is super cool for the customer, rather than thinking about what is best for people, profit and planet. But I, for myself, I keep that in mind. But um, in the large project that took uh, two years, what we did is, um, in the background, we had the circular idea uh, in the back of our minds, but we really started to do a competitor analysis, looking at what the cool startups are doing, and then developing that into an appealing proposition for the customer, and then uh, thinking, okay, how can we optimize that from an environmental and societal perspective as well? Because when, sometimes you go off in a direction and think, okay, we make it interesting and super appealing for the customer, and then you forget about the circularity goal, or you go too much in the other direction and you forget about the other goal. So I think um, you have phases in projects where you try to optimize one thing, but you always need to come back uh, to, to, to the end goal of circularity. And you need guidance from that, from either someone who is a sustainability director in a business or uh, someone external uh, like us, but it's, it's, it's quite complicated. But in large projects, you see it sometimes going off in one direction and you need to come back again. So I, I did notice that it's hard to optimize everything at the same time continuously. But it is possible, especially the move to services. When you look at the clothing industry, there's many startups on, uh, in, the, in rental and uh, um, sharing economy, like sharing uh, products and setting up uh, uh, swapping and that sort of stuff. It's very popular. So large businesses also have an eye on that and they see it as a huge opportunity that they are missing at the moment. Yeah. Question over here. My name is Peter Fandke from DTU here. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, I'm a researcher myself, and um, I see that there are a lot of challenges for circular economy, not just boosting it, but it's really hard to make it viable. Two examples are cross-contamination flows that need to be regulated or accumulation of chemicals in uh, materials that are recycled again and again and again and end up in food contact materials and whatnot. So um, it's just a comment maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm really missing a bit uh, the interaction with policymakers, with researchers, with stakeholders like consumers that uh, business models uh, seem to really rely on. Bring back your genes as an example. I mean, how is that incorporated in business models? How can that operational be incorporated in business models uh, to really heavily rely on people outside industry? Yeah, so I think in Europe we are, we're quite lucky we have the innovation deal as well, so we're also expected as researchers to be very uh, open to new opportunities for legislation and uh, think about that when we do our research as well. Uh, we just submitted an EU proposal on um, industrial symbiosis and also in the food industry and also trying to look at insects and so maybe insects as a um, not only a feed but also food. Apparently there's interesting legislation on uh, uh, insects as feed, food, etc. Um, but if we get to do it, we will also write recommendations for policy um, in, those, in those business models. But we already have existing businesses who are very willing to do that. So they look at insects as feed, but they also want to expand to food. And as researchers, we can help them in that way of thinking and look at the best business models that they could de develop, while at the same time writing re recommendations for policy within that. And, uh, but I think for policy to work, there also needs to be a business case. Like you wouldn't write a, po a policy without any business uh, that could jump in and say like that policy uh, would be for me. I think legislation is also driven by the need for businesses. You see it every day. Uh, same with the uh, mobile roaming in the EU at the moment. Uh, it's very much molded by uh, the current uh, mobile phone uh, providers who mold the legislation so it actually suits their current businesses. Uh, so I think it's very much uh, yeah, a tension between those two. Thank you. 
Thanks for the very nice presentation, Nancy. I really like your picture with all of the different archetypes for sustainable business models. And my question is, how do a company can identify what's the best archetype to focus on? And once they have identified, could they also follow the 10 steps that you have for circular business models for any other archetype they might have? Yeah, yeah um, at the moment we're doing research on which archetypes could actually be best combined. So we see that with archetypes like the move for services, that they can often be combined with different types of uh, business models. So we want to encourage companies to think about those things. I think it depends on the size of the business and the maturity of the business, which one they actually could go to in the short term. Um, one big uh, project with startups that we're doing at the moment is the move to services, like even with SMEs, if they're quite small, how can you go from moving products to, uh, to, uh, to selling services? And we do use the, the steps in that, like first, uh, the vision and the potential value proposition. And sometimes it, the business becomes quite different when you look at it. Like we're looking at a business uh, selling um, incubators for pigs, actually making the pigs uh, grow and the whole project suddenly became more about uh, health and um, the experience of, uh, of uh, interacting with animals for the customers. So it, it became a totally different business as a result of the discussion. And I think those businesses, large and small, find it also very exciting to think about their business as an experience rather than, oh, we just sell a product and then we forget about it. So I think they see, see their own business as much more exciting as well due to uh, using those tools. So yeah, you can use combinations of archetypes, choosing which one, um, depends very much on the business and where they're now at, at the moment. But I think the move from products to services uh, can be a very promising starting point. And could you maybe go back to the previous slide and explain how those 10 steps could work for another business model that is not circular? So these ones, how they could work for, uh, so, well, um, well, I think in all of those new uh, new projects, leadership is a, is a starting point. Like um, we intentionally call it leadership and not uh, not something more specific, because what we notice is that in businesses uh, you sometimes have those entrepreneurs, so people in the organisation who are very forward-looking and drive an idea, regardless of whether the CEO thinks it's a good idea. Uh, it happened in. Um, for instance, I think the Bugaboo Flex plan wouldn't have happened if it wasn't one of the people in the organization that showed that leadership and did it regardless of what the owner founder would have said. So I think uh, with a lot of these things, it could be any of you in the room, whether you're a CEO or not. If you want to do it, I think you need to create that space. And in the book, we also talk about change agents, like how you create a team of people around you that make stuff happen. Even in large organizations, uh, organizations like Unilever, we work with them, they also create internal teams of people who want to make stuff happen. So I think the leadership is, is the first big starting point and I think everyone can be in that position. Um, don't want to dwell on all the steps, but vision and purpose, I think things like the value mapping tool come in play in, in the vision and purpose. Also, what is your personal purpose? How does it compare to um, yeah, the purpose you have in business life and the purpose you have uh, in public life. So I think there's sometimes there's disconnections between what you do in your personal life, what you do as a hobby, what you do in professional life. I think your life is more in sync when you try to combine those. So we also have tools around that and make it, uh, make it more practical. Um, selecting the pilots. And I think that's where you need to start. Like, do I move to a service? Do I want to go for slow consumption, uh, move to solar? Uh, but that's, that's your personal vision and that's where you want to be a, a leader in as well. So it's very, you have to decide yourself. Um, visioning with partners, maybe. Yeah, and circular business model innovation, as I said, there's still a quite widespread um, range of innovation. So that's why you also need to work with those partners to develop the best business model. Like the Bugaboo Flex Plan also needed a different connection with retailers. Can you imagine what happens if you don't sell prams anymore, but if you suddenly need to lease them directly via your website? Potentially, you don't need a retailer anymore. So how do you still keep the positive relationship with the dealers who still sell the bulk of your products? So I think within each step, there's a huge 
barrier and you need to work together with those partners to overcome it and make the most of it because otherwise the dealers might hate you for going around it so maybe you can sell an experience in the shop and still sell them that lease contract uh, but uh, but let uh, let people experience the product in the shop so i think yeah working with others is very important and the contracting phase we have the example in the book of uh, of interface and how they set up the uh, the contract with uh, with aquafil and who's gaining what in that partnership so i think that's also very important like where does the money go who earns most etc uh, and how do you divide the pie the new pie of money so i think that's uh, one. And then evaluate, le learn, and start again if it doesn't work. So that's that's also the painful step at the end. Like you keep learning uh, and keep improving your uh, your business. But that's also normal business. It never stops. So. Yeah. Okay. Time for one last question, Michael. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Shield from uh, Teacher Management Engineering. Uh, maybe building a little bit from this, you had a slide showing that uh, sustainable business models and circular business models and product service systems are not synonyms, that there are overlaps, but there are also examples that, that they are not the same. I mean, that the sustainable business model is not uh, necessarily ensured by choosing one of the others. And I was wondering if you could, uh, could maybe speak a little bit about how does a company uh, you know, choose the right product service system model or decide whether that is a good model for them in terms of, of being sustainable and also for society. I mean, we see a strong push now towards circular economy. Mm -hmm. How can we ensure that this also becomes sustainable? What should society be worried about? I mean, where are the pitfalls yeah. or some pitfalls? Yeah, I think in that case, uh, being authentic is very important. Like if you're a, a business, a long ex as established business and you have quite a, um, yeah, a product that's, uh, that's is sold to, I don't know, people in the age category 30 to 60 uh, and it's known for being something that uh, lasts very long, then you should sort of build on that brand and make sure that it's built on the authentic, uh, authentic qualities of the brand. So sometimes a problem that, uh, that companies have, established businesses, they think, oh, everyone is going in that direction, so we need to do it like that. But I think you need to stay authentic and stay close to the brand and think, what is good about my brand? And what will be uh, the key futures that will also appear in the future business model that will make my brand stand out from the rest? So is it a decent quality? Is it something with vintage? Because uh, the products that you have that are um, many years old can still be rebranded. For instance, the skirt that I'm wearing is from Mary Mecca, like, uh, a brand that is established, but apparently is from the 1990s. So I bought it secondhand in, in a shop, uh, in the Mary Mecca shop uh, itself. So why did I buy it? Well, I believe that it's a brand that lasts long. Well, it proves that it lasts long because this uh, skirt is maybe 30 years old and it doesn't look to me like it's 30 years old. Um, so I believe that that brand does something that is close to its, its own characteristics. It still is authentic. So I think that is very important as a starting point uh, to start the journey. And you have to have the people, the key people in the room to, uh, to make that happen. But my concern is also the, you know, more the environment, the sustainability, yep. the social sustainability. So how do we assure that it's actually good for the environment or good for the, social, yep. uh, the human capital? Yeah, so at the moment, um, when we start a project, we use a slowing, uh, closing and narrowing uh, framework as a starting point to see the direction. So we map the different business opportunities uh, on that framework. So we, first of all, I think we need to make sure that it's also about slowing and not only about closing loops. So I think that's the most important one. I don't want to do projects that are only about recycling. So I think uh, the best project has a bit of everything in there. Um, and I think that's what, what uh, large businesses at the moment should be looking at. And that's a rule of thumb, but now we're also developing tools based on LCA uh, that can actually be used to do a quick, better assessment than just a rule of thumb. But I think there's still a lot of work to be done uh, to adapt tools like LCA uh, to the business model context. But that's still emerging work that maybe Mark has some answer to as well. But, um, yeah, at the moment we use uh, rules of thumb and try to do some initial modeling uh, as well. But that's why we're academics trying to invent new tools that, uh, that help as well.
Yeah. Okay. That brings us very close to uh, a break. Many, many thanks to you, uh, Nancy, for starting off with bringing all the, uh, the, uh, the terms to the table and uh, setting, setting some uh, thoughts in our minds. We still need to answer the question, should circular economy be the, uh, the panacea for us or should something else be the thing? But that, the idea of the day is that we ask ourselves a question after each presentation. But uh, many thanks to you for a great presentation.